I, uh, counsel, he could not pinpoint um, a time in which he knew that the relationship occurred. Um, there were many instances in which he described that very well could have fallen within uh, the time frame that was testified and um, by both uh, Ms. Willis, Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade as it relates to the relationship beginning uh, or, or transitioning uh, into dating uh, in March of 2022 and into um, uh, the end of the relationship in August uh, or the summer of uh, 2023. And as I referenced uh, to the court, uh, the statements that Mr. Bradley made, uh, the state would contend are inadmissible hearsay as it relates to the statements um, that uh, he was pressed and asked about um, what Mr. Wade told him, because Mr. Wade was never confronted with those statements. And in order for impeachment to be proper, he must be confronted with the specific statements um, that are alleged to have been made in order to impeach him. Again, um, Mr. Bradley had every uh, motive to lie. Um, I, I believe uh, the text messages are, are, are kind of clear, are very clear, as it relates to his di disdain uh, towards uh, Mr. Wade, um, which uh, due to the fact that you know he was uh, expelled or exiled from a, a thriving law practice, um, and um, it was clear that the, the practice and Mr. Wade sided with the alleged um, sexual assault victim, which is clear. Um, he assaulted her due to the fact that he paid her off. Uh, and uh, as I referenced uh, earlier, um, you know, Mr. Ms. Uh, Merchant represented to the court that Mr. Bradley had personal first-hand knowledge, uh, basically of, of, of it all, of everything, and that he would be able to basically be an impeaching machine. I think Your Honor referenced him as the star witness um, when uh, you were addressing uh, the claims that were made uh, by um, Ms. Cross in relations to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Merchant's representations to the court. And uh, what I would submit to the court is that all Mr. Uh, Bradley's representations as it relates to uh, whether or uh, when the relationship between uh, Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade began and um, whether they cohabitated, because that was a promise that was also made that he would be able to impeach um, the investigators as it relates to cohabitation was mere speculation, gossip, and innuendo. Um, and this is your honor. The impression I got, the impression I got, and we can correct this while we're all here together, is that they, Mr. Bradley directly overheard a statement from each of these individuals that they could be impeached with. Ms. Merchant, is that accurate? Directly overheard, uh, which ones are we talking about? Well, well essentially, they, they kind of seem to be all of them. Uh, you had said Alan, Bond, Young, and then the investigators, Hill Green and Ricks, could all be directly impeached by statements overheard by Mr. Bradley. Yes. In reference to your question, the uh, unequivocal answer was yes. And uh, when your honor uh, is looking through the text messages, I would uh, submit to the court that the text messages don't even um, say or indicate uh, what was uh, represented to the court in relation to uh, the good faith basis um, for this motion to disqualify uh, as it relates to uh, the testimony of and the ability to uh, impeach witnesses through uh, Mr. Bradley. Um, what's been referenced uh, by uh, all counsel is uh, Mr. Bradley's assertion of uh, absolutely as it relates to uh, whether um, the relationship existed prior to uh, uh, Mr. Wade's hiring. And the question in itself involves speculation because it asks, do you think it started before she hired him? And he says, absolutely. He doesn't say he know. He doesn't provide any context as to how he knows. And in these text messages and through his testimony with the court, his, the source of his information um, was unclear, uh, what I would, what was what I would say to the court. Um, as to a lot of things, um, other than the, the one conversation that allegedly occurred uh, between um, Mr. Wade and Mr. Bradley. And I would submit to the court that that conversation never occurred. That, that would be the state's contention. Um, and how do we know that? We know that because that conversation um, was not confronted, or Mr. Wade was not confronted with that com uh, conversation. And that is evidence circumstantially, um, and I'd even say direct, as to that conversation not existing because based on the representation made by defense counsel, it would be clear that that would be a conversation 
that would have been relayed to, because it wasn't privileged, um, as Your Honor found, um, that would have been relayed to Ms. Merchant. And if that conversation happened, you better believe that would have been a conversation that defense counsel would have confronted Mr. Wade uh, with and against. And the reason they didn't do that was because it didn't exist. Uh, again, uh, you heard from uh, Mr. John uh, C. Floyd III, um, the district attorney's father. Um, as Your Honor heard, he was a well-respected uh, member of uh, the legal community uh, for over 40 years. Um, but the importance of his testimony was to provide the court with corroboration as it relates to um, the years leading up to the relationship uh, that uh, transitioned into uh, dating between uh, the district attorney and Mr. Wade. Uh, what he testified to is that he moved into her South Fulton home in 2019. The evidence of uh, his moving into that home at that time was his uh, Georgia driver's license, um, a government, uh, official government document. Um, he further testified that not only did uh, it wasn't that just Miss Willis and um, himself live at the South Fulton um, home, but that he often would see on uh, numerous occasions uh, the significant other of uh, Miss Willis that was not Mr. Uh, Wade. Uh, he referenced that uh, that person had a nickname of uh, Deuce and that he kept a lot of his belongings in the garage of Miss Willis. Um, he specifically said he kept a lot of his uh, uh, disc jockey equipment, as he as, is how he referred to it um, uh, when before the court. He uh, made very clear that he had never seen Mr. Wade at the South Fulton home uh, that is owned by Miss Willis. Uh, he made clear that um, he lived uh, in that home with Miss Willis and Miss Willis alone, other than um, her two daughters um, that, who would occasionally visit that home until. Um, February of 2021, but what uh, precipitated um, the uh, soon move uh, of Ms. Willis to uh, what I would reference as uh, safe houses uh, for her protection was uh, a, a protest that occurred before her home in February of 2021. Um, he then uh, expressed to the court that uh, Ms. Willis moved in the spring of 2021 and that due to these threats that uh, were taken very seriously, he had only seen his child uh, 13 times. Um, he said, uh, in reference to uh, the questions uh, by defense counsel, that um, were in a, <clears throat> and I'm just going to be uh, straight up with the court. It was they were trying to make Miss Willis a liar. Um, what is how I would submit to the court in the sense that uh, she testified that she was concerned for her safety and her family's safety, which included her father and um, her daughters and that um, Mr. Uh, Floyd remaining in that home kind of uh, rebutted all of that, made it so it wasn't true. But he testified that he stayed in the home because it was the home that she had uh, put her blood, sweat, and tears uh, in and uh, was able to buy, and that he stayed in the home because there, were, uh, there was constant officer presence. He told the court that he bought extra security equipment. He even went as far to tell the court that he slept in different rooms on different nights because he, because he felt his safety was in such a, a concern. Uh, so I would submit to the court that, that line of questioning was uh, done in an attempt to uh, discredit Ms. Willis, but failed, um, would be this, uh, what the state, how the state would characterize it. Um, then he testified about um, the first time that he did meet Mr. Wade, which is in uh, 2023 uh, here uh, at the district attorney's office. And uh, he talked about um, how he kept cash in his home and why Miss Willis kept cash in his home. And what I would, uh, what the court should take note of is uh, the state didn't ask Mr. Um, Floyd about the cash in his home. That came out through the cross examination of defense counsel. Um, so there was, a, a, I guess, an implication um, that uh, Mr. Floyd only did so due through his preparation with the state and his uh, hearing and seeing um, news articles uh, and uh, clips uh, related to the testimony uh, that had occurred prior to him. But I would submit to the court that it's telling that that information came out through uh, questions that were asked by defense counsel, which gives credibility uh, to the statements that uh, were made. And he further explained as to why he um, taught his daughter to keep cash 
uh, in the home as it relates to financial independence and having a safety net. Um, it was further testified that he had multiple safes um, and that he gave Ms. Willis uh, his first lockbox, or her first lockbox, um, for uh, situations uh, as she described um, when she was testifying. And what I want to make clear is during Ms. Willis's testimony, it was pressed about the cash and where she kept it, and did it follow her, where she laid her head, um, and things of that nature, trying to further discredit uh, the practice uh, that she had as it relates to keeping cash in her home and why she was, had the ability to pay cash to um, Mr. Wade and other people and for other uh, situations. And uh, what I, I would, what the court should take note of is that there was no evidence that controverted that at all. Where, where was the evidence that controverted Ms. Willis's claim and practice of keeping cash in her home. There was none. In fact, the only evidence was is it was uh, substantiated through the testimony of her father, Mr. Floyd. Furthermore, uh, you heard from uh, Governor, uh, former Governor Roy Barnes, um, and uh, his testimony was significant and important because uh, what I would how I would phrase it, uh, Your Honor, is it debunks this let, me, let me, on this point, mm -hmm. and I think you might have had a more recent opportunity to review his testimony than I have. Mm -hmm. You say on the slide that she was the first choice to lead the prosecution. Was that actually his testimony, or was he just, was his testimony that he was asked to come aboard? Did he use the words that he was asked to lead? Yes. Uh, it would be, that, that's my recollection, that he was asked to, to lead the prosecution. He was asked to... Um, Take the, or he was asked to fill the position that Mr. Wade is currently in, which is the lead prosecutor. Um, it was said in that way as well as it relates to the testimony of Mr. Barnes. So I think it would be very clear. My recollection is that he said lead, but what I can submit to the court that I, I know he also said that he was asked to, to fill the position that Mr. Wade is currently uh, filling uh, for the state of Georgia, which is the at lead prosecutor. At that time, as special grand jury prosecutor, right? Yeah. The special, I guess, yeah, as the special prosecutor lead the investigation, which um, <coughs> led to the ultimate prosecution um, that we're here before your honor uh, today. Um, he also indicated that the reason he turned that job down was because it didn't pay enough. He said he had mouths to feed uh, at his law firm and that he also didn't want uh, to uh, live the rest of his life with bodyguards because he had lived that for the the years in which he was uh, the governor of Georgia. Uh, furthermore, um, he confirmed the qualifications uh, of Mr. Wade, um, which I still <coughs> find it quite interesting and confusing as to attacking uh, Mr. Wade's qualifications in that it's, it's almost as if Ms., uh, uh, Mr. Roman's counsel is asking that the state put a prosecutor on the case that she sees to be more qualified to uh, attempt to convict her client. Um, it, it, it's an interesting uh, ar argument, and it's one that makes no sense. Furthermore, um, if you were to believe the claims and allegations um, as it relates to Ms. Willis' personal stake in the prosecution, the receiving of financial uh, be uh, benefits uh, and gains, then you'd have to believe that she was also dating Roy Barnes, the former governor, and uh, Gay Banks, uh, in addition to Mr. Wade. Um, if she has this grand plan scheme uh, in order to um, uh, profit off of the prosecution of this case. Because that's what they're saying. Or they're saying that she's uh, she telepathically or uh, prophetically uh, was able to um, know that Mr. Barnes and Mr. Banks would turn down the position so she could then uh, hire Mr. Wade. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And it, it, it is... It's, Desperate. It's in a desperate attempt to remove a prosecutor from a case with, for absolutely no reason, uh, Your Honor, other than harassment and embarrassment. Um, this slide, and we've been through uh, a lot of the testimony. And I should be clear there, it was not introduced in evidence that Mr. Banks turned her down, right? That's not, is that part, how's that part of the record? Well, uh, I'd ask the court to take judicial notices. Um, has been asked uh, repeatedly. Unless uh, the district attorney had testified to that. I don't recall offhand. Uh, I will be frank with the court. I don't recall if uh, okay. uh, Ms. Willis testified to that exact fact. 
but I know that Mr. Banks represented that to the court uh, during uh, Monday's hearing as it relates to the allegations that were made. I understand Your Honor's position as it relates to that. I'm trying to make sure we, we know exactly what can, is in the evidence and is not, but well, uh, regardless, uh, I think your, your point is made. I think it's in evidence of the, of the record as it relates to, um, I guess, the issues uh, that led up to uh, the actual hearing of this case. So I understand Your Honor's position. Um, but uh, it did come out uh, during, <coughs> several or during a proceeding um, uh, that was prior to uh, the actual hearing. Um, this slide um, is just a, a chart showing kind of the testimony of both um, uh, the district attorney, uh, Ms. Willis, and Mr. Wade as it relates to how they met, um, how uh, or when uh, Mr. Wade became the special prosecutor, when their relationship evolved into a romantic one, um, uh, talking about the trips. Uh, in which they took uh, after uh, their relationship uh, evolved into one uh, that uh, became romantic and um, when it ended. And what again I would submit to the court is that those facts um, were consistent and uh, the only uh, person who contradicted that um, the, when the relationship started was uh, Ms. Yurdy. And what I would bring to the court's attention is that it was represented to the court that Ms. Yurdy was a witness other than Mr. Bradley who could um, bring to the forefront this issue of cohabitation? And when pressed and when asked about it, Ms. Yurdy had absolutely no information as it relates to this alleged cohabitation. It was false. She said she had no information. She was asked about trips. She said she had no information about the trips. Yet, she's such a good friend that uh, Ms. Willis uh, confirmed each year uh, that Mr. Wade and her uh, continue to be in a relationship 2019, 2020, 2021 until uh, their relationship um, ended due to her uh, forced resignation and um, it's splintering of their friendship, Your Honor. Uh, you, uh, her, I guess, several exhibits obviously were uh, tendered in. Uh, most of them were um, exhibits that came from uh, the sealed uh, divorce of uh, uh, Mr. Wade and um, uh, Miss Jocelyn Wade. Um, contracts for legal services, trip itineraries, and um, the text messages. Um, and I would specifically reference uh, prior to today, the only text messages that were before your honor uh, were uh, uh, defense exhibits 26 and 27, uh, which um, it's the assertion of defense counsel that um, what those show is that Mr. Bradley uh, was an informate or was uh, had information as it relates to the relationship starting prior to um, March of 2022, and that's just false. Those text messages do not contain that. It, it does not pinpoint, just as Mr. Uh, Bradley couldn't, when the relationship actually started. And furthermore, you have the testimony and the evidence of the text messages that it was mere speculation. If you, as Your Honor, reviews uh, the full chain of text messages, it is clearly Miss um, Merchant and Mr. Bradley um, going through what I can describe as nothing else other than a, a mere fishing expedition uh, between the two of them at first, because it's asked about certain members of the DA's office who would have, have information um, as it relates to specifically, for one, Ms. Young. It is asked whether she would have information, and he had no idea. He said he assumed he was speculating. And that is the same as, as each person that was subpoenaed uh, in reference uh, in the text messages. Um, all of that was speculation, and you know it was speculation because not a single one of them testified. That's telling, <clears throat> because if it wasn't mere speculation, if it wasn't mere gossip, and if it wasn't mere conjecture, each one of those people who were uh, subpoenaed would have been called to testify, like uh, District Attorney Willis was, like uh, Mr. Wade was, in order to be confronted and then impeached by Mr. Bradley. Um, You've heard, uh, obviously, about uh, the phone records, and I have a maybe, because uh, whether it comes uh, into the purview of your honor as it relates to um, the determination that your honor is to make um, as it relates to uh, the disqualification of the district, district attorney. You also have the affidavit um, from uh, the employee who worked at the winery who confirmed that Ms. Willis uh, did, in fact, pay uh, in cash um, <coughs> up to uh, more than $400. Um, and. I understand that it, this is part of the proffer of the state, but it's important because that is a witness who the state didn't go find. The state, that is a witness who went uh, to CNN in order to confirm what Ms. Willis um, testified to, further giving uh, her, 
her statements, credibility, and credence um, before the court. You heard about... Uh, well, before we move on from that one, other than the foundational concerns, uh, would you have a, a response to the proffer of the cell phone records? I have, uh, uh, I'll get to that now, I was going to get to it later, but I, I have several foundational concerns as it relates to the cell phone records. Um, I don't think I've ever, uh, as Mr. Sadow's uh, motion makes very clear, the state uses cell phone records routinely. And I would agree with that. We use them routinely. But we use them with an expert. And they're always challenged. Right. So, like I said, in the interest of time, setting aside the foundational concerns. Oh, I thought you were asking about them. No, no, no. The focusing on the substance of them. Assuming that it would be admissible in the guise that he's proffered. Well, what's, I know, maybe you have that further up, but what's, what's the reaction to that? So, what I would say initially is that um, due to the fact that they were analyzed by someone who was a non-expert, um, the analyzation of those cell phone records um, were not uh, properly peer-reviewed. They were not, uh, it, it's clear um, from uh, the state's review that the, the normal uh, practices that are used uh, to check um, the use of which kind of data is being used. Um, in reference to the two specific dates, um, I believe it's September 10th and 11th and November 29th and 30th, uh, the uh, affidavit uh, that is used to say that Mr. Wade remains at Ms. Willis's or in the area of Hapeville, because um, again, during the hearing, the address um, for the um, Yerdy uh, condo never came out. It was just that it was the Hapeville condo. Uh, the f actual phone number for Mr. Wade was never established. And the documents that were provided to the state as that were certified uh, business records did not have a, subs a subscriber page. So we have no idea that the number belongs to Mr. Wade. Now, I understand Your Honor wants to look past the foundational issues, and I, I can appreciate that. But the foundational uh, stuff is very important as it relates to the admissibility of the records. No, no, no doubt about that. But if, if somewhere, how they were able to survive those foundational concerns, do you have any, any reaction? Yes, I, I do, and I can... I will skip forward so I don't. Um, so what's interesting is that the records um, that were provided uh, were for, they start in January of 2021, and they go, uh, I believe it's to uh, November 30th, I think is what the, uh, of 2021, the span of the records. And you heard from all of the witnesses, including Ms. Yerdy, that Ms. Willis did not move into uh, the uh, hate bill address until um, April of 2021. That was the testimony from all of the witnesses, April of 2021, and that she lived in her South Fulton home uh, from uh, her, when she met Mr. Wade in October of 2019 up until when she had to move. And the assertion by defense counsel is that Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis began a relationship right after they met in October of 2019. What's interesting and what's telling is that Mr. Wade's handset doesn't once appear in anywhere near the area of her South Fulton home, but they're dating, but they're in a serious relationship. And if you were to believe what the defense counsel says, that they have been in a relationship from October of 2019 up until she moves uh, in, uh, April of 2021. So, you know, a year and a half or so, but he never once enters the area of her home. But they want you to believe that that's a lie, which is why uh, counsel uh, for defense continued to press uh, District Attorney Willis and Mr. Wade as to whether he had ever been to that South Fulton home. Well, this corroborates that that was not a lie, that he had never been to that home, and uh, it's more than suspect if you've been in a relationship, as they claim, for all this time, but never once, never once went to the house. So uh, I think that's telling. Um, what I would also bring to the court's attention uh, in the state's uh, initial review of the records that uh, from January of 2021 to March of 2021, uh, those times when Ms. Willis did not live again at the hateful address, um, she didn't move there until April of 2021, <laughs> that his uh, handset appears in that area 23 times. Sure. Why how do, how do you reconcile that with this testimony that was alluded to, I think, by uh, opposing counsel, the reasons he gave for being in the area? Well, would, the, would those line up to 23 times? I think, you know, I, uh, well, it didn't give too many reasons for being there, right? Well, that's, well, I think that's the point. I would say yes, that is the point. He, he referenced that that's an area that he 
um, it was not uncommon for him to be in. And it, clearly that is the case because Ms. Willis didn't live in that area. So again, it's further corroboration as to what Mr. Wade indicated to the court. And uh, when, I guess after Ms. Willis uh, moved into the condo in April of 2021, uh, they appeared 35 times. Now, I, I want to make clear to the court, uh, both Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade never denied that he had been to that condo before. Um, the, the, the specific testimony that was uh, elicited by Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade was that he, never, he had never laid his head, uh, was the direct quote, um, at, at that condo, which these records don't prove that he laid his head anywhere. If you were to believe uh, the, uh, the analysis or if you were to, um, uh, if you were to give credence to uh, what the non-expert says as it relates to um, Mr. Wade's handset, on uh, in September and November for the three to four hours that the phone uh, is alleged to have remained. Um, that doesn't disprove anything that, uh, that was testified by both um, Mr. Wade and District Attorney Willis. It was that he visited there. The specific hours of, his, uh, of their visits was not something that uh, was uh, pursued during the questioning of both uh, of the parties. So um, what I would also submit to the court is that if you look at the days um, as it relates to uh, in September and November, the use, uh, the, I guess the type of information that is used to make uh, the plots for the longitude and latitude of the handset is uh, data records. It's not voice records. It's not SMS or text messages. It's data records. And uh, it is not uncommon for an expert to testify as it relates specifically to AT&T records that that actual data record is uh, unreliable as it relates to the location of the handset due to the type of information that it is, that it's data. It's not the voice and the SMS, which I know, Your Honor, as has been referenced, is, uh, was a prosecutor not uh, only here in this county, but um, for uh, the federal government where this kind of information is commonly used. So um, in the comments that were made by the court, it was clear that you uh, understood and understand the use of cell phone records as it relates to put somebody uh, in an area, and again, not in a specific location. Um, <coughs> I'd also bring to the court's attention, as it relates to the validity of the affidavit and the analysis done by um, the expert uh, that was hired by um, Mr. Sadow, is that not once does it reference uh, the uh, fact that AT&T records commonly have duplicate and triplicate entries uh, within the call detail records. Um, that is something that is commonly seen, and that is, that is something that is seen uh, in, in these records. And that is something that leads to um, the incorrect number of times that has been alleged that um, Ms. Uh, Willis and Mr. Wade were in communication um, through text and voicemail. And I'd also submit to the court that that number doesn't prove anything again, doesn't prove that anybody's in a relationship. Um, it, it proves that they were in communication with each other. And um, I, I think Your Honor can use your own life experience as it relates to people you work with or friends uh, that you are close with uh, and the number of times that you um, make calls um, to uh, any of those people. I can uh, submit to the court that um, I have a friend who I've been friends with for 15 years and she worked uh, in, in the office previously with me and based on our professional relationship and our personal relationship, the friendship that we had uh, had and still have, that we talk uh, 30 times a day. So there's, and that doesn't mean we're in a relationship. So the, uh, the assertion that the number of times that uh, Ms. Uh, Willis and Mr. Wade have uh, spoken to each other, whether it's through text message or um, phone, it it's, has no validity as it relates to them being in a relationship. What I would submit to the court is that what was shown through all of the evidence was that uh, there's been a true cost to Ms. Willis as it relates to her life, that she had additional expenses that she had to uh, endure uh, it because of her position in the sense that she told the court that she had a mortgage, but on top of that mortgage that, uh, and a house she uh, didn't live in anymore, she had to pay uh, for a safe house, um, that her home was vandalized, uh, and um, there were racial uh, epithets and uh, sexual bigotry that were spray painted onto her house. The uh, concern of 
her safety and her life is something that, that was testified to. And the fact that this job has led to um, the isolation and separation of her from her family and friends, which was um, given credence and the credibility of those statements were provided by her father, um, Mr. Floyd, that he had only seen um, his daughter 13 times since all of these instances occurred. Um, the the cruel <coughs> nature of the statements and the falsehoods that for example, in these text messages that were purposely leaked to the media as it relates to Ms. Willis's daughter, subjecting her, uh, her uh, position uh, in school that she flunked out of, of college, which isn't true, uh, which in fact she has graduated from an HBCU, but what's been leaked to the media is the fact that she um, flunked out of school and someone other than her father moved her, which again, the validity of which was never um, shown. Um, and all the while, um, Ms. Willis facing these costs has been able to continue to do the work unrelated to this case, uh, which is shown in the fact that um, Atlanta's murder rate and violent crime rates have decreased while she has been in office. But what was shown through the testimony of all of the witnesses and through the evidence um, that Your Honor heard was that there wasn't an actual conflict, that the defense failed to provide any sort of actual conflict uh, in relation to uh, Ms. Wade's, uh, I guess, the relationship uh, that uh, transpired um, from uh, the relationship between her uh, and Mr. Wade, and that there was absolutely no evidence of a financial uh, benefit that she gained uh, as it relates to the prosecution um, of this case and the ultimate outcome of the case. Um, the corroboration of all of that is the things that Your Honor is very much aware um, that she could have, uh, I guess, financially benefited from uh, stretching out the case, uh, for lack of better words, by uh, the grand or the special grand jury recommended that 39 individuals be indicted. But uh, through her sifting through uh, the special grand jury's uh, report and all of the evidence with uh, the team uh, that indicted the case, uh, they only uh, went with uh, 19 of the defendants, which. Had she gone to 30, gone with all 39, there's, uh, there, based on the defense counsel's assertions, um, she would have given her the opportunity to certainly uh, find these uh, financial gains uh, that are claimed uh, through the allegations of defense counsel. More importantly, um, why would Ms. Willis repeatedly ask this court to set a trial date as soon as possible if her uh, motive um, in prosecuting this case was to continue to um, financially gain as alleged um, from the prosecution of this case. It, it doesn't line up, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense for a reason, because it doesn't exist. More importantly, um, this office has several <coughs> multiple RICO and uh, as well as uh, large scale cases like this one, and much larger, um, and they also have, uh, there's a lot of high profile prosecutions. If Miss Wade's, or excuse me, Miss Willis's ultimate goal by hiring Mr. Wade was for her financial benefit, then she would put Mr. Wade on every single one of those cases, so she could uh, certainly uh, revel in the um, uh, riches uh, and lavish lifestyle um, that has been referred to by defense counsel, um, which there's been absolutely no evidence of. The evidence was she stated a double tree in Napa, a double tree. I don't know that to be a, a lavish hotel. Um, most people, when they go to Napa, if they want to lavishly experience uh, Napa, stay at the Ritz-Carlton, the Four Seasons, things of that nature, not a double tree. So the allegations and assertions that Miss Willis was living the lifestyle of the rich and the famous is a joke, <coughs> an absolute joke. Uh, as it relates to um, what you heard uh, and the, the secondary issue, uh, is the forensic misconduct, and uh, for lack of better words, uh, what it has to be shown is that the statements that were made uh, by or he, here, Ms. Willis, related to the prosecution of the case, and ultimately the guilt or innocence of um, the defendants. And we have none of those statements. There's been no evidence. Nothing has provided to your, been provided to your honor as it relates to Ms. Willis' specific <coughs> statements made about any of the defendants and in relation to the guilt or innocence of any of the defendants. I forget which defense counsel referenced the fact that she said she had a 95% conviction rate. Well, what Ms. Willis's job is to instill confidence uh, in the community as to how 
how well she is doing as it relates to her constitutional duties. And that was exactly what was done when she referenced that she had a 95% conviction rate in the previous year um, that she was serving as a district attorney. More importantly, um, it's been uh, the allegations uh, about race and religion being uh, imputed in uh, her speech. Uh, and um, that, that those comments were directed at the defendants at this table. And if you listen to the speech, those comments are directed at two uh, elected or political officials. Uh, I believe it was Marjorie uh, Taylor Green and um, Ms. Bridget Thorne, who is uh, a member of the Fulton County Board of Commissioners here. She specifically used their names. I don't, I don't know that they, uh, and my knowledge is they're not supposed to be sitting at the table and I haven't seen them uh, in my um, work as it relates to uh, this case. Uh, Your Honor. So uh, those allegations that Ms. Willis committed uh, forensic misconduct are, again, there, there's no validity to them. There's no evidence of them um, as it relates to any of those comments, uh, which um, is, this is an issue that Judge McBurney um, has previously ruled on uh, when uh, these same allegations were uh, alleged as it relates to extrajudicial statements uh, made by uh, Ms. Willis. Um, and it, it involved a, a statement that uh, the the words fake electors uh, were said uh, by Ms. Willis, and he found there was absolutely no uh, conduct that was impermissible, impermissible as it relates to uh, forensic misconduct. And uh, I guess to drive home the point, um, at no point in any of the statements that were made uh, and that were uh, that were that are alleged uh, here as it relates to the speech um, that she made um, at the church, um, at no point did she mention the guilt uh, or innocence of any of the defendants. Um, she again was merely responding to comments made by Marjorie Taylor Greene and Bridget Thorne, uh, two other political uh, officials. Uh, therefore making her comments not even close in the realm of any sort of forensic misconduct. What I find interesting is that defense counsel um, wants to um, make these allegations that Ms. Willis committed this forensic misconduct by the statements that she made uh, in her defense as two unrelated, in this case public officials, um, criticized the job that she was doing. And, uh, I find the hypocrisy uh, interesting in the sense that we've had uh, video proffers released to the media by defense counsel, emails between uh, counsel released um, to the media by defense counsel, statements have been made uh, by defense counsel um, at, in relation to this case. We had the unredacted version of the cell phone records of Mr. Wade released to the media by defense counsel with his private and personal information um, causing um, the threat of harm to both Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade uh, to increase. We, uh, the most recent uh, instance was the text messages that Your Honor hadn't ruled on their admissibility um, prior to their uh, release, and it was uh, made clear during the hearings that the ability to uh, get those, uh, the full chain, uh, was something that uh, they were unable to do. Um, but they figured a way, and the minute they figured a way, uh, they released it. Uh, the information to uh, the media simultaneously with turning it over to uh, the state and the court. <clears throat> For all the reasons uh, obviously stated uh, before your honor um, that this motion should be not be should be denied uh, because the legal requirements by uh, that are required uh, in order for the district attorney to be disqualified have not been satisfied. The defendants have failed to raise any issue legally or factually to satisfy the legal standard um, for uh, disqualification. They must show an actual conflict. They've been unable to show that the prosecution of this case was at all a result of political bias, which has been um, uh, accused, or accusations have been made, as well as demonstrated that the prosecution of this case was motivated by any means or any way because of malicious prosecution. And they haven't been able to prove that this case was one of selected prosecution for political benefit or gain. All allegations that have been made during the course um, of uh, different hearings and the procedures uh, as it relates to this case. Um, what I would leave uh, the court with, kind of how uh, the state started uh, the argument, is that courts have uh, been generally unreceptive 
if not hostile, to attempts to disqualify prosecutors based on pervasive and institutional conflicts, which makes clear that the uh, burden that the standard is very, very high that must be met in order for uh, a district, uh, an elected district attorney to be disqualified. And that burden, that standard has not been met. An actual conflict has not been shown. And more importantly, uh, in, in conjunction with that, there's been absolutely no evidence that the district attorney has benefited financially at all, but benefited financially in conjunction with any uh, outcome, whether it be now or uh, ultimately as it relates to the prosecution of this case. Uh, and because of all those reasons, Your Honor, we respectfully request you deny defense counsel's uh, motion uh, to disqualify uh, the elected district attorney, uh, Ms. Fonda Rose. Thank you, Mr. Bogdan.